Good morning. <sighs> Continue to pray. Uh, COVID is a weird thing. I am 100% recovered, but if I sing a song about halfway through, it's just the windedness just comes in. Uh, and so for those of you who've worked through that and processed through that, you, you know that sometimes there's just like a long residual struggle. I chase my kid around one lap, and I feel like I've chased my kid around 40 laps. So that's just the way it goes. Um, a few months ago, um, we were talking about um, leadership in the church and, and, and all these kind of good, fun things. We were looking at the books of First and Second Timothy and Titus, and I commended to you um, a podcast called The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. Some of you might remember that. Um, if you listen to that, raise your hand. Some, some folks kind of, there's a few folks that, that took a listen to that. Um, my wife, it's, it, it ended in December, and my wife right now is working through it because she just, you know, has headphones in watching a toddler every once in a while, and I was like, yeah, you talked about that a few months ago. Maybe I should give it a try. And so she's, like, telling me, like, that church did what? Like, that happened? I'm like, yeah, you know, a month ago I, I listened to that, so I remember that vaguely. But it's, it's a great podcast because it, it cycles through the rise and fall of Mars Hill Church. And it does it not in a gossiping way, but it does it in a way that's helpful because it helps us to understand leadership successes and leadership failures and how leaders in the church fail and what can go wrong when certain things aren't done in good order. And so for a church that became one of the largest churches in America uh, and then kind of died overnight, it's this case study that's autopsy in a way that is really helpful. And so now that it's over, it's neat to go back and kind of think through all of the different things that, that I learned from that. And so I would recommend you go listen to that on podcast app. You can Anywhere you get your podcast, it's just called The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. Um, but it chronicles a leader, a specific pastor, I won't mention their name because we don't want to do that in kind of an online broadcasted format, um, but this leader is, is prominent, is gifted, um, and is immensely good at the preaching of the word. This is a guy who, as I was going through college and things, a guy whose sermons I sat under, I listened to religiously for years and years and years and gleaned a whole lot from, and so we, we oftentimes, when leaders fall from grace, we want to seek to completely discredit them, right? Like that guy renounced his faith, so the book that he wrote six years ago is completely... But we have to be careful because leaders rise and fall for a whole host of reasons. And so I think it's important that we acknowledge that there, are, there is good in leaders that have fallen from grace at various times, right? Like if you right now, uh, would I feature a Ravi Zacharias book in the front lobby of our church? Probably not, right? Because of the recent fall that we have heard about. But does that mean that something he's written isn't still good and useful? Well, no, right? I'll take truth written by somebody, no matter how awful they are, right? If it's truth, it's truth. And if it's good, it's good. And so today we, we talk about this podcast just because the, the judges cycle we're looking at today is, is that kind of a leader. It's a guy who started the right way, um, really in every way. When you look at the beginning of Gideon's story, it's really, it's a lot of our stories. It's kind of how we came to be Christians and part of the faith, and for those of us in leadership positions, how we came to be in leadership. And so when you look at the end of Gideon's story and the complete destructive downfall, I think it's important to do an autopsy of a, of a judge's cycle like Gideon, because we want to know how does someone go from A to B and what are the things that we can avoid along the way that help us to prevent that in our own lives? And so this morning we're going to look at the story of Gideon, and we're, we're going to skimp around a little bit. Just because, as, as you notice, <clears throat> there's, there's a hinge point in the book of Judges, and it's at this point right here, where the Judges cycles 1, 2, and 3 that we've covered already are relatively short. The last one when we're looking at Barak and Deborah are a little bit lengthier, but that's because it's the same story told twice, right? There's one chapter of the story and one chapter of the actual song of that story. And so now the story of Gideon actually spans four whole chapters of the book of Judges. Like it's four times longer to read. And so if we just read the story of Gideon, it would be a 20-minute sermon. I could just read the text, do no sermon prep, say amen, and we could all go on our way. Um, my wife is expecting a baby any moment. There may be a Sunday coming where that's exactly what we do, where I get up here and I read the text and I say amen, uh, and I come down and go on my merry way. Um, you may see me up there one of these next Sundays coming up. But for now, we're going to skip our way through uh, a little bit the book of Gideon, or the chapters that involve Gideon, uh, and then you know, we'll kind of see what we can learn. Okay, 
The other hinge point is that the first three judges, while we talked about the good and the bad of them, they were overall good people, like good leaders, right? They each had selfish motivations and none of them were in the end like perfect or worthy of emulating, but they weren't chaotic. We're now getting into the chaotic, right? And Gideon is the hinge of that, right? He starts good, he ends terrible. From this point on, most of the judges that are to come are just going to get progressively worse until eventually Israel just gets crazy on its own and just spirals down more and more, right? We'll look at the cycle again before we read the passage. But this, this time we want to look at Gideon and we want to trace his leadership fall. <clears throat> and here's how this whole thing sets itself up. So chapter 6 of the, of the book of Judges is the call and equipping of Gideon, right? It's all about how the Lord takes him and makes him a judge, Right? Last week, we talked about Deborah and how she just kind of showed up. There was no, how did God call her to be or raise her as a judge? It was just kind of, she was there. Right? Today, we get a really detailed description of how the Lord calls Gideon into being the judge and deliverer of Israel in the cycle. So that's chapter 6. Chapter 7 is the actual battle and victory over the Midianites. That's the current oppressor in this cycle. Chapter 8 is what happens in the aftermath of that whole battle and victory. Right? So ch chapter 7 ends, he wins the battle, spoiler alert, and then 8 is what he does after, and that's where really the downfall hit. Chapter 8, verse 4 is the hinge of this particular story today, where we start to see Gideon just go way downhill. And that's where we want to pay attention and say, well, what, what happens there that is a little different from the rest of the story? And then chapter 9 is what I would refer to as the epilogue, and it deals with Gideon's son. So we see how his actions have affected the next generation to come and how Israel is just completely thrown into ruin and shambles. And so that's our outline. We're going to cover four chapters today. We are going to read a lot, but we're not going to read four chapters, I promise you. Because again, we would be here forever. But first, a repeat, the Judges cycle. Every single time we have a story in Judges, this is what happens. Israel falls into sin. They worship other gods. Eventually, they are oppressed because the Lord allows a people group of some kind, today it's the Midianites, to come in and rule over them and to give them trouble and to, to mess with them. And so they live under the thumb of that ruler and they're oppressed. They cry out to God and the Lord, because he is merciful, he raises some kind of warrior, judge, deliverer, prophetess, whatever you want to call it. They're always called judge, but they kind of look different each time. Whoever it is, he raises somebody up that he then uses to crush the oppressor that he originally allowed to oppress them, and then they live in relative peace until that judge dies, and then the whole thing repeats over and over and over again. And remember we talked about every time it gets worse, right? That's the beautiful theme. As we're in the midst of Northeast Ohio winter, we aim to make everybody feel uplifted here at Stoprez, and so every week in Judges is worse and more depressing and sad than the last. Uh, the good news is we have three weeks left. Next week, we're going to combine the last two judges together because I don't know that we can last that long in the midst of this cold winter weather. Right? Reminds me of a time I took an intensive class on the book of Job in January. <laughs> eight hours for five days straight, eight hours a day on, on that. There, if you had struggled with any kind of serious issues of, of depression, you shouldn't have taken that class. They actually had a disclaimer, like, don't, don't, go find joy. Like, this is sad, right? <laughs> We will be happy after this. The good news is after this we get into Lent and we talk about the crucifixion of Christ. And we get, you know, so it's just going to keep coming. Um, but anyway, let's, let's dig into the book of Judges and look at Gideon's story. And we'll kind of go verse, uh, verse by verse in some ways and, and unpack this for us. Here's the beginning. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian for seven years. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel, and because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. They would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel and no sheep or ox or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents. They would come like locusts in number. Both they and their camels could not be counted, so that they laid waste the land as they came in. And Israel was brought very low because of Midian, and the people of Israel cried out for help to the Lord. Right. So this, is the, this time we're dealing with Midianites. 
And the time frame is way shorter, right? The last oppressions were like decades long. This one's only seven years, but its intensity has ramped up unbelievably. Right? They're not just being ruled by an oppressor and occasionally messed with, some of them being killed, some of them imprisoned. It's, it's all around complete devastation of the Jewish people. Right? So the Midianites would come in every so often to the land and they would just completely like annihilate everything. Right? They would either take or kill all of the animals. They would wipe out all the crops and take it home for themselves. And it was one of those, like, not only did the Midianites want stuff from the Israelite people, but what they didn't want, they wouldn't even leave for them. They would just torch it, right, and just leave everything a barren wasteland. To the point where the Israelites are actually retreating and hiding in the mountains. They start going and hiding in caves and hiding their food and their sustenance away so that they can survive at all. Right? The oppression has ramped up. If you think that you've been persecuted, you haven't experienced the Midianites. They've perfected the art of making you feel like there is no hope left. And so after seven years, the people can't take it anymore, and they cry out to the Lord because starvation is becoming very real and very possible. Right? So that's where we find ourselves. And then the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, this is when he comes to, um, to Gideon, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you. And he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. Right. So Gideon, when the Lord finds him, is in the hills. He's using a wine press to beat wheat because it's, it's hiding it from the Midianites. Like they're up there processing their food in the caves and in the mountains so that the Midianites might not find all of them. And he's, he's doing it sneakingly, and the Lord comes to him, and his calling is very similar to Moses in some ways. There's a lot of judges hearkening back to Exodus, but he's this weak man, right? The Lord comes to him and says, I'm going to use you to save all the people. And he's like, I'm, I'm not your guy, God. Like, my, my folks are the weakest, and I'm the weakest of them. So, like... Right? Do we hear Moses, I'm not worthy, I'm not enough, right? David, I'm just a small guy, right? And the Lord says, but listen, um, am I not the one sending you? Like, I am the one that's going to do this through you. I'm going to do the work. All you have to do is go and I will accomplish this. And so I don't care how small you are, I don't care how weak you are, right? I'm going to use you to do this. And so Gideon is, is a little bit in and on board, but he still hesitates some. He's a very timid, humble guy, which is good in some ways, right? There's nothing wrong with having a healthy fear of doing the things God calls us to do. If we walk in the ways of the Lord, he will use us to accomplish stuff that we shouldn't be able to accomplish on our own. And so that ought to be scary, right? The Christian life should somehow, at various times and turns, be terrifying. And so Gideon is not bad here for being afraid. He has a healthy dose of humility. He knows who he is, and he knows who the Midianites are. And he knows that he's a puny little guy. And how on earth is he going to go up against them? Right? And so he wants to test the Lord. And so he says, you know, hold on. Will you humor me? I'm going to go make this offering. And then I kind of want you to do some stuff with it and show me that you really are who you say you are. And so he presents an offering to the Lord. And the Lord consumes it with fire. And so Gideon then knows that, you know, he is who he says he is. Now, this, we're going to skip ahead a little bit. Um, now all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east came together and they crossed the Jordan and encamped in the valley of Jezreel. But the spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon and he sounded the trumpet and the Abizrites were called out to follow him. And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh and they too were called out to follow him. And he sent messengers to Asher, Zebulun and Naphtali and they went to meet him as well. So Gideon is, is obedient at this point. And he sounds the trumpet. He goes to the tribes and he starts calling the people together and getting them all as ducks in a row, right? And they show up 
and there's this army, and we see the Midianites are kind of crossing into Israelite territory, and meanwhile, Gideon is gathering his folks, and so we're building up to the clash, right? When are they going to come together? And it's to the point where they are there, <clears throat> the Israelites are there, everybody's there, we're about to have some battle, and Gideon gets afraid again. And so Gideon has this test for the Lord that seems really weird and arbitrary. Then Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, behold, I am laying a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece alone and then is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And it was so. When he rose early next morning and squeezed the fleece, he wrung out enough dew from the fleece to fill a bowl with water. So he does this test. He tells the Lord, hey, I want you to make everything dry except for this one little piece of fleece. And so the Lord goes, okay, I'll do that, I guess. That's a weird request. But... And so he does it, and he's faithful. Right? The Lord isn't angry with Gideon here. He understands that this is a terrifying thing. And so he humors him. He, he works with him. And then after that, he's still not satisfied. So Gideon says, let not your anger burn against me. Let me speak just once more. Let me test just once more with the fleece. Please let it be dry on the fleece, and all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night, and it was dry on the fleece only, and on the ground there was dew. So Gideon tests him. The Lord humors him twice. And so finally, Gideon is ready to actually obey, right? And so we see that this battle is approaching. The Lord is calling him to rise and go, and he gives him instructions on how to, how to rise and go. But there's a problem. Gideon has like 30,000 men. And the Lord says, Gideon, that's too many guys. I, I know that in the, in the past, I've helped you win some battles as God's people. And then afterwards, you've kind of just credited yourselves with the victory. So if you go in here with 30,000 men and you win, you're going to be tempted to think that you had anything to do with this. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you to go to the people and ask them, Anyone here who is afraid, you can go home. Imagine being the general of an army that's about to go up against someone like seven times your size. And the Lord says, hey, I want you to tell all the scared people that they're allowed to go back home to their, to their wives. And so, <laughs> so Gideon's obedient. And it says 22,000 people went home. And so roughly 10,000 were left. So like two-thirds of the army is gone. They're all scaredy cats. Now we're in 10,000, and Gideon's like, okay, um, I was maybe hoping for a better outcome there, but all right, let's go to battle. And the Lord says, eh, hold it. That's still too many. You picture Gideon like, I like a lot of people. <laughs> we could, can we just have 50 and romp, and I'll just praise you after? And the Lord says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take them all to the river and tell them to get a drink. And those... Separate those that kneel down and drink straight from the water and those who lap up the water with their hands and their tongues. And so 300 of them lap up the water and the rest of them kneel. He separates them out. And you picture Gideon looking at the 300 and the 9,700 going, please, please don't. <laughs> but of course God says, all right, the big crowd, you can go home. And so Gideon is left with 300 guys to fight this fight. And he's terrified. Understandably so. The Lord tells him to get ready and to go. And so the morning of the battle, the Lord actually is very understanding. And he says to Gideon, look, I know I'm going to ask you to go up against these guys. If you're still scared, why don't you go and spy on their camp and just listen? Right? And so Gideon with some folks goes and he listens and he hears Midianite soldiers talk about this dream they had the night before. Right? And they dreamt that the Israelites essentially annihilated them. And so this dream, hearing of this dream, gives Gideon the last little bit of confidence, right? The altar being consumed by fire wasn't enough, and the fleece wasn't enough, but we're finally to the point where he's, he's willing to obey. And so he takes his 300 men, and here's what the Lord has him do. So Gideon and the 100 men who were with him, it's supposed to be 300, came to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch. And when they just set the watch, they blew the trumpets and smashed the jars that were in their hands and then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the jars. They held their left hands, in their left hands the torches and in their right hands the trumpets to blow. And they cried out, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Every man stood in his place around the camp and all of the army ran. They cried out and fled. 
When they blew the 300 trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his comrade and against all the army. And the army fled as far as Beth Shittah towards Ze- Zerera. That's a hard one. As far as the border of Abel and Mahola by Tabith. So here's what happens. These people, the Israelites, come around the camp and they're holding trumpets and, and, and torches. Like trumpets in these jars and they, and, they, and they crash the jars down and they blow the trumpets and they yell their little battle cry from like the woods, from the tree lines of where the army is. So the army can't even see them. They just hear the Israelites. The Midianites are kind of encamped. They hear them. And then the Lord actually causes the Midianites to fight and kill themselves. While the Israelites just stand there and watch. All right, that's the battle. If this was, like, there's a reason that Gideon didn't get made into a movie. Because it would be like the most anticlimactic thing ever. You have all this great lead up and then the battle. If they're like, for Gideon and the Lord. And then you just watch the enemy just, like, combat itself to death. Right? And so that's, that's how this battle ends. Gideon wins the battle without doing really so much as a thing. Right? They had trumpets, they smashed jars, they have a shout, and the Lord causes the Midianite army to annihilate itself. And those who survive end up fleeing back towards their home. It's about 15,000 or so left. Right? And then Gideon calls on the tribes to chase them down. And they end up capturing the two princes of Midian, Oreb and Zeb. If you're ever wondering what to name your kid, Zeb. Uh, Judges is just full of good names. Why do we have baby books? We should just like hand the book of Judges to like expecting mothers and just tell them to pick. Right? Zeb. Um, and they kill them in the end. Right? So they killed the two princes of Midian. Everything's done. The Midianites are out of their land and gone, those who are left. And the threat is over. And so seven concludes with this little bit. And then things go south. Gideon, here's 8-4. Gideon came to the Jordan and crossed over. The Jordan is the edge of the promised land. So when Gideon crosses it, they're no longer in Israel's territory. They're not in the land that God has given them anymore. Right? He's going past their borders. He and the 300 men who were with him, exhausted yet pursuing. And so he said to the men of Sakoth, Please give loaves of bread to the people who follow me, for they're exhausted, and I am pursuing after Zeba and Zalmunna. Those are the kings of Midian. And the officials of Sukkoth said, Are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna already in your hand, that we should give bread to your army? And so Gideon said, Well then, when the Lord has given Zeba and Zalmunna into my hand, I will flail your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. And from there he went up to Penuel and spoke to them in the same way. And the men of Penuel answered him as the men of Sukkoth had answered. And he said to the men of Penuel, when I come again in peace, I will break down this tower. Here's why this is the hinge point. From this moment on, Gideon is no longer acting according to God's plan. This wasn't part of God's calling on him. The battle's done. The Midianites have run and retreated. They are out of God's territory. They're not in the promised land anymore. The threat is over. You've captured the princes of Midian and killed them. We're done. This is where the credits would roll, or we would see some shot of a wedding or something happening. It's beautiful and fun, and the end, happily ever after. But Gideon's not satisfied. And so Gideon crosses over the Jordan, past his own territory, and he decides that he wants to completely annihilate every last Midianite and take matters into his own hands. If you read this in its entirety, if you read the whole of chapter 8, you will notice that the Lord is strikingly absent from it. Because God has nothing to do with what Gideon's doing now. Right? And so he even gets to the outskirts. before, As he's crossing, there's the towns on the edge there that are Sakoth and Penuel. And he tells them, you have to help my people. They're tired. We need sustenance. We need, we need healing. We need doctors. We need help. We need to get ready so that we can go chase them. And the townspeople are even saying, Gideon, like, haven't you already, like, you've beaten them. Like, why? What, what else is there to do? Like, why would we give all of our resources towards a war that's over? Right? And so Gideon's response is, I'm going to go get these guys, and then I'm going to come back, and I'm going to deal with you, right, because of what, the fact that you're not willing to help me. And so he does that. Gideon comes back. He, he gets the sons. He brings them back, the kings. He brings them both back. And then the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us. Oh, sorry, I I skipped ahead of there a little bit. Um, When he comes back, 
Gideon comes to the cities of Sakath and Penuel, and he deals with them harshly. And here's where we see the complete destructive downfall of, of God's people. When Gideon comes back to his own communities after he's gone and captured these kings, he comes to, to Sakath and he completely whips and beats the 70 elders of the city, like his own people, the Israelites. He pulls out the 70 elders and he humiliates them and beats them in front of their own people. And then he goes to Penuel and he kills every man in Penuel. Gideon's now murdering his own simply for the fact that they defied him and wouldn't help his army accomplish a task that the Lord never called him to accomplish. Right? And then when that wasn't enough, he asks his son to actually kill the captured kings and his son won't do it. And so then when the kings mock him for being weak, he ends up killing those kings himself. Again, not part of the Lord's plan. Right? None of this is part of the Lord's plan. And so after all this is done, the men of Israel, they come to Gideon and they say, rule over us, you and your son and your grandson also, for you have saved us from the hand of Midian. Notice who's getting the credit. Like somehow Gideon is the savior here, right? even though he's done nothing. Nothing. And Gideon said to them, this is the one good phrase he has, I will not rule over you and my son will not rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. But then Gideon said to them, let me make a request of you. Every one of you give me the earrings from his spoil. They had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. And they answered, we will willingly give them. And they spread a cloak and every man threw, it in the ear threw in it the earrings of his spoil. And the weight of the golden earrings that he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold. Besides the crescent ornaments and the pendants and the purple garments worn by the kings of Midian. And besides the collars that were round the necks of their camels. And Gideon made an ephod of it and put it in his city in Ophrah. An ephod is, in tradition, it's this priestly, like gold priestly vestment that has gold woven into it. So Aaron, as a priest in the time of Moses, would have had one of these, and priests throughout the time would continue to have these. They had these, these kind of vestments that were very majestic. In, in the case of Gideon, though, he's not really making that. His is much more an idol. He creates this golden idol, much like the golden calf that was created earlier in the history of God's people. And what we find out next is that the people actually start to whore after this thing. Right? The people get all wrapped up in this idol and they start to worship it. And it becomes the snare to Gideon. And so Gideon, yeah, he's refusing, he refuses officially to be king. But then he makes an idol for the people to worship instead of them worshiping the God that they are supposed to serve. And the story of Gideon ends with him retiring into his own homestead where he was. And then here's what's unique. The very end of, of the chapter tells us that he had many wives and concubines. It wasn't normal for just the average Israelite guy to have many wives and concubines. As a matter of fact, it was actually commanded in Deuteronomy that the Israelite kings shouldn't have many wives and concubines. That was something that foreign kings did, right? And one of the marks of being a king is that you had a whole bunch of wives, probably intermarriages from other, tri you know, other tribes and, and nations to kind of politically advantage yourself. But he takes all these wives and concubines. And so what we see is Gideon refuses officially to be king, but man, he acts like one, right? And through all these wives and concubines, it says that he fathered 70 sons, and then he fathered one son to a concubine rather than a wife. And that son is Abimelech. And Abimelech is the ultimate downfall of the people of Israel. Things just keep going south. Right? After the Midianites, the people of Israel enjoy peace until Gideon dies. And then after that, Abimelech actually tries to make himself king. He's the one son that is born to a concubine that has like no right to the throne. There are literally 70 brothers that have a, right? Like who's like 70th in the British line of succession, right? Can you picture the queen dying and that guy coming out and being like, I'm it, I'm your guy, right? Some guy named Pete that like works in the basement, <laughs> right? right? Someone Google it. Who's the 70th line of succession guy? You can tell me after the, after the sermon's over, right, to get the crown. But Abimelech is this evil guy, and he tries to usurp authority, and so here's what he does. He goes, 
and he, he drums up the people of Shechem in support of himself, and then he goes and he kills all the other brothers. He misses the youngest one, but he kills all the other brothers. And so in the end, Abimelech rules for like three years. And Jotham, the youngest one, eventually rises up and, and calls him out. And the, the story ends with Abimelech finally, ultimately dying. We don't have enough time today to dig into the details of that. But I would encourage you to go read Judges 9, because that tells you the story of Abimelech from start to finish. And so at the end of all of this, you have a guy who killed the entire offspring of the last judge to make himself king, only to die himself. And you're now at a point where the Israelites aren't just acting poorly, but they're killing each other on a regular basis. It's no longer unique. Right? Gideon's done it. His son's done it. And you're going to start to see this cycle of murder and bloodshed and internal struggle eventually divulge into full-on civil war by the end of the book. Right? And so we have this leader, this guy Gideon, who starts so strong. And here's what happens. He's a nobody in the hills, and the Lord calls him to a great work. Right? At some point or another, the Lord has called all of us to do something, to be a part of his kingdom, to, to effectively work for his purposes and for his glory. And some of the times we've listened to that, and some of the times we haven't. But one of the things that happens with leaders is that they start to become so successful that they go on their own. And they start to think that they can do things apart from the Lord rather than under his rule. Right? We as God's people have to remember that we only find success if we order ourselves under the way that God is calling us and in the directions that he's calling us to go. Right? The second we go our own way, we have the capacity for immense downfall. Right? The second I get up here and I start to think that, that I'm the stuff, Things go south. The second we do anything by our own bootstraps in this church, rather than relying on the Holy Spirit to empower us and to call us consistently to what's next, things will go south. And we will meet the same fate. Here's the truth. We can look at a guy like Gideon in judgment, but every one of us is one bad decision away from being a Gideon. That's what happened in the podcast I mentioned. That pastor of Mars Hill was a strong leader with a giftedness for people and for reaching people and for preaching. There's a reason that church grew to be like the largest church in America in a matter of just a few years. Right? That doesn't happen by accident. But the ego came in and started to rot away. And eventually that guy thinks that I can do things on my own way and my own timing. One of, the, one of the hinge points in that podcast, and this is important, is when things start to go south, there are some people that suggest to this pastor a certain level of accountability. He said, you know, there's some, there's some great pastors, you know, the likes of, of, a, of a John Piper or someone like that. You know, you, you should sit under some of these guys. And his response was, yeah, but their church is smaller than mine. How can I be mentored by somebody who has a smaller church than me? <laughs> you hear the ego that takes over. When we start to think that we can do it on our own, when we start to think that the things that the Lord is using us for are happening because of how awesome sauce we are, when we start to make our own plans rather than obeying the Lord's call on our lives, you're one bad decision away from following in the footsteps of a Gideon. Every one of us has that capability. And the moment you think you don't, watch out, because it could be you next. Right? And so we're called to always be on guard, to submit ourselves to the Lord, to continually walk in his ways and to ask ourselves, where are you taking us? Individually as Christians and collectively as still Presbyterian Church. Right? That's the job of you as members. That's the job of your elders and leadership in calling us to go where we're going to go next. Right? To ask, what is the Lord doing? And get on that bus. We don't get to drive our own bus. Right? Let's pray. Lord, thank you. We thank you for your guidance. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the way that you are at work in the life of this church. And Lord, we pray for all of its leaders. 
whether it's staff people, it's volunteers, anyone who holds a position of leadership in this building, Lord, that you would continually be at work in the midst of their lives. That you would hold them accountable. And that you would guide them to go your direction and your way instead of following our own. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for the way that you have built this church up and for the leaders that you have given it. For the people that are in charge, from elders to deacons and pastors over the years and staff people that are seeking to faithfully obey your will and your ways. And Lord, for each of our lives, we pray that you would keep us on your path. We thank you for accounts such as that of Gideon that remind us of how fragile we can be and how quickly we can let our own ego turn us into something we don't want to be. We pray for your protection and your faithfulness in reminding us of your truth and of your grace and of your mercy. Love you and we praise you. And all as people said,